Um, hello, I would like to call the Southline Community Schools School Board meeting of April 20th, 2020 to order. Mr. Abate, please call the roll. Okay, I am here, Ms. Zertel. Here. Mr. Schwegler. Here. Mr. Clark. Here. Mr. Dashner. Here. Mr. Kennedy. Here. And Ms. Sanshaw. Here. With that, let's please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United, United, United States, States of America, America, to the Republic, to the Republic, to the Republic, one nation, one nation, one nation, one nation, one nation, one liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you, and uh, welcome everyone to uh, Southline Community Schools' first virtual meeting. Uh, quick thank you to Chester Cox and Jeff Russell for getting us up and running. Um, we will start today with um, public comment. Um, there is about a 20 second delay between our live stream and our actual meeting. So if you are doing public comment, um, we would ask that you mute the live stream and um, use your phone. And in order to get on, if you haven't already given uh, a comment card turned in. You can find those on the agenda, which is uh, found in the board uh, position on the district website. And once you come in, make, make sure your phone is muted. And when you're ready to speak, when your name is called, you need to hit star six to unmute yourself and then mute yourself after you're done. With that, um, we have a number of public comments. Our first one is Ms. Ellen Coner. Are you there? We'll give her a couple of seconds to see if she gets logged on. Okay, we can move on to our second person. If um, Ms. Koner joins us, she can jump right back in. Uh, but next we have Russell Aches. Again, if you are doing public comment, if you could join on as soon as possible and uh, be ready. Uh, I see someone new has joined. Gary, would it be appropriate to table the comments till after item six? We can do a little bit of the basic business and then that'll give everybody a chance who wants to speak for public comments to call in or log in in the next couple minutes. I don't know if that's appropriate or if we just pause and wait for people to log in or call in. Um. I don't know, do we need to make a motion to change the agenda for that? Yes, you would need to change the agenda. Correct, so can I get someone, uh, can I get a I'll, motion? I'll, I'll move then, Carrie, that we move public comments, um, let's say till after item six to allow for folks to call in or log in um, at that time. All right, moved by Mr. Kennedy. Support. Supported by Ms. Ertel to move public comments uh, to item after item six. Um, Mr. Bate, will you please call or questions or comments? 
Uh, are, are the people that are on the phone, are they able to get in or we, do we know if there's a technical issue or what's going on here? I'm not sure. I see at least one phone logged into our meeting. Uh, Jeff or Chester, do you have any feedback on what might be going on with public comment? Uh, no one is restricted from dialing in. We do have one person that has dialed in. I'm not sure who that is, uh, but I don't believe it's any of the <clears throat> video attendees. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, yeah, the number doesn't correlate to any of the um, comment commenters. That may be Jeff from Bard Mail that right. called in. I know we were able to um, successfully do public comment call in when we practiced on Friday. So I know that we were able to do it at that point. Um, okay, well, let's um, at least finish this item. Um, Mr. Bate, will you please call the roll for moving the public comment to after item six? Sure, uh, Ms. Sancha. Yes. Mr. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Dashner. Yes. I vote yes. Mr. Clark. Yes. Mr. Schwegler. Yes. And Mr. Tell. Yes. Okay. With that motion passes seven to zero. We are moving public comment to follow item six in our meeting tonight. All right. We'll move on to item number four, which is approval of the agenda. Um, can I get a motion to approve our new revised agenda? So moved. Support by Dashner. Moved by Mr. Tell, support by Mr. Dashner. Any additional changes needed for tonight? Okay, with that, Mr. Abate, will you please call the roll? Sure, Mr. Tell. Yes. Mr. Schwegler. Yes. Mr. Clark. Yes. I vote yes, Mr. Dashner. Yes. Mr. Kennedy. Yes. And Ms. Vanshaw. Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number five, approval of minutes. Do we have a motion to approve the um, March 16th, 2020 regular meeting and the March 19th, 2020 special meeting? Moved by Clark. Support by Kennedy. Moved by Mr. Clark, supported by Mr. Kennedy. Any questions or comments? Okay, with that, Mr. Bate, please call the roll. Sure, I vote yes. Mr. Dashner. Yes. Mr. Kennedy. Yes. Ms. Hanshaw. Yes. Mr. Tell. Yes. Mr. Schregler. Yes. And Mr. Clark. Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item ah. number six, approval of bills. Do we have a motion? Yeah, this is Dashner. I move to approve the March 2020 prepaids, the April AP bill run, the March 2020 wires and ACH transactions, and the March 2020 revenue report. Second by Clark. Moved by Mr. Dashner, supported by Mr. Clark. Any questions or comments on the approval of bills? Uh, just for a if you could, just for a comment, I did ask. Uh, uh, Mrs. Witt regarding the one question on the bills and that was the uh, evidently that was the printing of the May bond informational letters and I did ask for clarification on what that because I didn't know what it was so that was on the first page of the very first uh, AP run. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, with that, Mr. Bate, will you please call the roll? Uh, sure. Mr. Tell. Yes. Mr. Schwegler. Yes. Mr. Clark. Yes. I vote yes. Mr. Dashner. Yes. Mr. Kennedy. Yes. And Ms. Hanshaw. Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Um, now on to the um, public comment. I'm still not seeing anyone new in our list. <laughs> Um, but I do know that um, a couple of the um, people that submitted public comment asked me to read them. So I'll start with those. And if the additional people join us, um, they can join us. Um, first was 
Uh, Mrs. Baines asked that, um, that the kids and the coaches need a gym for the many school activities competing for space and time at the South Lion East High School. And we had another, oops, another comment that said, please read. To it. Um, we had a number of emails today also regarding the same topic um, about the um, need for an East Auxiliary Gym. Um, but let me see if I can find the other one. Okay. It's hard to read on this Excel spreadsheet. Okay, this comment was made by uh, Mr. Brian McNamara, and he also commented that um, traveling back and forth between the two high schools, um, it's very clear that the South Lion East facilities are not large enough to handle large school events, competitions, and tournaments, and that with the South Lion East student body of over 900 students, um, they are in dire need of another um, auxiliary gym. So um, those are the, oh, here's another clue for you. Um, Ms. Dominic, Dominique Stant also stated, um, I think the new gym would be very beneficial to my team because there have been many instances when other teams have walked through our practices or at the end of our practice due to the fact that they don't have an individual space. And I think those are all the ones that I that were asked me to read. Um, okay, so we still have a number of people on the comment um, list that would like to speak. Um, we can move them to the end of the meeting at this point, since it doesn't seem like anyone else has been able to log in. Um, President Hanshaw, if I may. Yep. Um, I, I'm wondering if we have some confusion because on the agenda that's on the district website, there's no call in phone number listed. And so you can fill out the card, but we haven't told anybody how to join the meeting. I think once you filled out the comment card when you submitted it, you were given a response with a phone number and a pin as a reply to your comment is the okay. way I understood it to work. And is that I correct? also wonder because we had for we had the old agenda with the old Google Hangout on there for what 24 hours. I'm wondering if maybe some of the people are trying to do that also. Okay, yeah. So anyone who um, has submitted to speak in public comment, if you check your email in response to your comment card, there will be a phone number and a PIN number that you need to enter in to join the meeting. Okay, we had one person test it out and it supposedly worked. Unfortunately, we probably should have had somebody fill out a card and see if they got the phone number back. The comment card is live, correct? Yes, it is. Yes. Because I have my other computer on. I could click on it and do a comment and see what pops back. Dan Schwagler just did that. I just okay. did. 
I'm wondering if uh, maybe Chester or Jeff could go into presentation mode with the dial-in number. Looking at YouTube, there are nine people watching in case one of those are the public comment people that can't get in. Just a thought. Um, side note, we do have 14 people that signed up on the public comment and all 14 of them um, stated that they wanted to speak about the need for an auxiliary gym at South Lion East. So hopefully we'll get a chance for them all to speak, but just so everyone knows that's, there were at least 14 people that had a comment regarding the gym. You know, I, I would suggest that we move them to the end of the meeting, uh, public comment, and they, we may resolve some of their comment topics during the bond presentation with Barton Mello. Yep. Okay. Um, so it sounds like a couple of people have tried now the phone call in with the pin and they seem to be working. So hopefully those that wanted to speak um, will able to do that, will be able to do that. Um, there's another time for public comment at the end of our meeting. So we will move anyone who would like to speak to that point. Um, and you can also continue to add public comment um, throughout the meeting up until that point. So um, with that, let's move on to item number seven, which is technology wireless access point bids. Yes, bids were received on February 27th for the wireless access points. Five bids were received. It is the administrative administration's recommendation to award the purchase to the low bidder Presidio contingent on the 2020 bond passage at a total bid price of $221,423.40. Do we have a motion? I'll move to award the bid to Presidio for the wireless access points. Thank you. Support. Moved by Mr. Kennedy, supported by Ms. Ertel. Any questions or comments? Okay, um, with that, Mr. Abate, please call the roll. Okay, Mr. Kennedy. Yes. Ms. Tanshaw. Yes. Mr. Dashner. Yes. I vote yes. Mr. Clark. Yes. Mr. Schwegler. Yes. And Ms. Ertel. Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Um, continuing on to item seven, the license warranty for access points. Yes, bids were received on February 27th for wireless access points, license and warranties. Five bids were received. It is administrative administration's recommendation to award the renewal license warranty to the low bidder, Presidio, contingent on the 2020 on passage at a total bid price of $150,796.80. Thank you, we have a motion. I'll also move to award the licenses and warranty for the access points to Presidio um, contingent. Okay. Support. Support. Moved by Mr. Kennedy, supported by Mr. Swagler. Any questions or comments on the um, license and warranty for access points? Okay, with that, Mr. Bate, please call the roll. Okay, Mr. Swagler. Yes. Mr. Tao. Yes. Mr. Clark. Yes. I vote yes. Mr. Dashner. Yes. Mr. Kennedy. Yes. And Ms. Hanshaw. Yes, motion passes seven to zero. Item number eight, technology network switch bids. Bids were received on February 27th for the new network switches, including a 10 year license and warranty. Five bids were received. Um, it is administration's recommendation to award the project to the low bidder, Presidio, contingent on 2020 bond passage at a total price of $132,787. Thank you. Do we have a motion? Uh, 
I will again move to award the bid to Presidio for the technology network switches. Support. Moved by Mr. Swagler, supported by Ms. Ertel. Any questions or comments? That was Mr. Kennedy. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Dan. You got it. <laughs> I was looking at Mr. Swagler. He was the main person on the screen. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Okay, Mr. Bate, please call the roll. Okay, Mr. Clark. Yes. Ms. Hanshaw. Yes. Mr. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Dashner. Yes. I vote yes. Uh, Mr. Shrugler. Yes. And Mr. Uh, Tell. Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Moving on to item number nine, summer paving. Yes, bids were received on April 7th for the summer paving project. Seven bids were received for the project. It is administrative's recommendation to award the projects to the low bidder, True North Asphalt, at a total bid price of $60,860. Motion to approve the summer paving by Dashner. Second by Clark. Moved by Mr. Dashner, supported by Mr. Clark. Any questions or comments regarding summer paving? Okay, Mr. Bate, please call the roll. Okay, I vote yes. Mrs. Attell. Yes. Mr. Schwegler. Yes. Mr. Clark. Yes. Mr. Dashner. Yes. Mr. Kennedy. Yes. And Ms. Hanshaw. Yes, motion passes seven to zero. Item number 10, acceptance of gifts. All right, South Lyon East High School received $5,000 from the South Lyon Education Foundation for their uh, therapy dog named Olive. And Olive was purchased from Green Acres uh, Labradors, LLC. And also Hardy Elementary uh, received a stationary bike from the Bellamy family. And they will be using that in the school's sensory room. And that was a value of approximately $200. I would recommend that we accept the gifts in accordance with policy 9350. I will move to support accepting those gifts or move to accept the gifts. Rather. Support by Dashner. Moved by Mr. Abate, support by Mr. Dashner. Any questions or comments on our acceptance of gifts? Other than we're very excited to have Olive joining our district. With that, Mr. Abate, please call the roll. Sure, Mr. Dashner. Yes. Uh, Ms. Tanshaw. Yes. Mr. Kennedy. Yes. I vote yes. Mr. Clark. Yes. Mr. Schwegler. Yes. And Mr. Tell. Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Uh, Item Ms. Tanshaw, could I very quickly, yes. um, like I typically do in a meeting, I, I'm, I'm switching up the order uh, as, that we vote just for the sake of fairness, uh, but I wonder if in this format, if, if it's throwing everybody off for me to bounce around like that, would you rather me just have an order and stick with it? No, I think to continue to rotate is probably the best. Okay. Yeah, this is fine, but thank you. All right. Okay, item 11, approval of a job share. Thank you. Uh, Jill King and Kelly Bingley have requested a job share again this year. This is their fourth year in doing it. It would be for the 20, uh, 2021 school year. And this job share is um, supported by the East administration. And I would recommend that you approve the request for the job share assignment as presented. Do you have a motion? So moved by Dasher. Supported by Clark. Any uh, moved by Mr. Dashner, supported by Mr. Clark. Any questions or comments? I'll just say that my son has Mrs. King right now and he supports it as well. So <laughs> got some background. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we're able to do this for them. So um, with that, Mr. Bate, please call the roll. Yes, Mr. Kennedy. Yes. Ms. Hanshaw. Yes. Mr. Tell. Yes. Mr. Schwegler. Yes. Mr. Clark. Yes. I vote yes, and Mr. Dashner. Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 12, approval of child care leave. All right, thank you. And Robin Path has been on child care leave for much of the 1920 school year. 
Uh, she's requesting a second and final year of child care leave for the 2021 school year. And this is some contract language in the SLEA, SLEA um, bargaining unit. I would recommend uh, that we approve the request for the child care leave as presented. Okay, do we have a motion? So moved um, by Dashner. And can we support? Moved by Mr. Dashner, supported by Mr. Kennedy. Any questions or comments? Uh, I just have one. Um, I assume the long-term sub, are they gonna be coming back for another year in that position? So each year um, we have the opportunity to hire, um, you know, teachers. Sometimes those teachers that were in the long-term guest teacher position that are getting a full-time job, whether it be with us or somebody else, uh, certainly it would be a nice uh, transition to put that person into that position, but that will be decided upon as we make sure that we have all of our people, because um, we do have somebody that's on a child care leave now, for example, that's going to be coming back. So there is no guarantee that that person would still be in that position. Um, but the administration certainly recognized the work that that person has done. Um, okay. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, Mr. Bate, please call the roll. Okay, I vote yes. Mr. Clark? Yes. Mr. Schwegler? Yes. Mr. Tell? Yes. Mr. Dashner? Yes. Mr. Kennedy? Yes. And Ms. Vanshaw? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item number 13, bond presentation resolution calling for bond election on August 4th, 2020. This agenda item will include a bond presentation that will have a review of the August election, financial information, bond projects, and schedules prior to approving the resolution. We are going to have Barton Mallow and IDS do a presentation and then have the board vote after the presentation. All right. Carrie, I think we need a motion uh, before we start your presentation. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, before oh, before the presentation. Okay. Um, all right. So let's. Can I get a motion to approve the resolution as presented? Yeah, moved by Dashner to support the bond uh, resolution for the August election. Kennedy supports. Moved by Mr. Dashner, supported by Mr. Kennedy. Um, should we do the presentation before we vote on it? Yes. Okay. Yep. All right. Perfect. Thanks. Jeff, are you there? Yes. How about uh, um, our, Jeff Atkins? Yeah. How about Jeff Atkins from Barton Mallow? I don't hear him. He's been in and out a couple of times trying to make sure he's connected. Is it possible he can call in through the comment card phone number? Probably. I see his mute tag on. Maybe that was an attempt to turn it on and off. Yeah, it wasn't working even when his mute was off. Stand by one moment. <laughs> it feels so official when <laughs> Jeff gets on and tells us to stand by for a moment. <laughs> yeah. Be like I'm working for NASA. Mm hmm. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me now? We yes. can. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry about that. I don't know what the problem was. Um, so, okay, I guess I'm, I'm ready to start the presentation. Perfect. So, is that something Chester can bring up, or I need to bring my screen over? Okay. 
Yeah, Jeff, you can bring your screen over. All right, I'm trying to share it right now. Okay, I can see it. Oh, excellent. Okay. And I apologize for the uh, glitches. So, all right, is everybody look at the title screen to South Line Community Schools 2020 bond program? Yep. 2020 bond program? Yep. Yes. yes. All right. Great, thank you. Um, so, um, what we're going to do is give you a brief overview of the bond program. Um, originally, we've looked at a lot of this information before, back when we were looking at a May election, and we want to share with you specifically what's changed between now and going forward with an August election. So, for sake of an agenda today, what we wanted to do is look at the financial information and what the implications are for moving from May to August. We also want to talk about the project schedule. That's the largest change from the original uh, May election to the August election. The scope will remain the same, but the schedule will slightly change. And then also talk about next steps as far as the timeline for the project. So why go for an August vote? Uh, this is something we wanted to make sure to take some time on. We feel that there's some very key points to this as far as why we'd want to go with an August election. First and foremost is that we can go for an August election and still have a no tax increase for the school district and the, um, the community and still accomplish everything that we had in the original May election vote. So that was very key to us to make sure we didn't have to come to you with a reduction in the scope or an option to ask for some additional tax dollars. Second is there is a lot of the stuff on the bond program that is infrastructure needs that has to happen regardless of a bond or not. These are things like your roof spoilers and parking lots, things that do have an end of life, that they are nearing those right now. And that if we did not have a bond, these would be things that would come out of your capital fund or your general fund. So these are things to keep the buildings operational. The third bullet point, something that's very topical is just, I believe that what this has shown us is that even though we can do online learning and we're all getting better at it, even though we had a technical glitch here, um, there's still no better way to teach students right now than the actual bricks and mortar being inside of classrooms. So I don't think we can replace that at this point, that those are still important to have those, those buildings in our district. So it's important to keep those things up to date um, and modern. The first bullet point is very similar to the second one is operational dollars. But the slight take on this is that there are a lot of things in this bond program that will actually save operational dollars. These are things like your buses and your technology, things that you need to purchase regardless. There's also stuff like the synthetic turf that will save you operational dollars from the grounds crew. And there's also things like you're um, operating some lights to save energy. So um, in addition, you know, not only does this reduce your operational dollars, it also saves operational dollars. Um, and then the last thing is we know that with all this that's going on right now, there's a potential for some reduced funding or definitely not an increase in funding next year for your per pupil allowance. So we feel with that potential coming that it's even more important that we consider this bond program at this time. So some financial information for you. Um, Stacy has worked with PFM, who is our financial consultant for this, to look at ways to structure a bond program that still allows us to complete the uh, $98 million to of work, or not, well, just under $98 million of work, um, and still go for the, um, still for make it a not tax increase. What this does, the substantial change in this is that we can't have as much work happen in the first two years. Um, we are limited to how much we can bond for in that first series. <clears throat> I'm going to jump to this next page here. It's a little easier to show the comparison. So, Originally with the May election, that first series was gonna be about $74 million. I'm looking at the project cost column. So in series one of the May election, we originally were at $74 million and that was gonna be spent over the first three years. So roughly call it $25 million a year. And then series two would be at the tail end of that program for an additional 23 that we'd be spent in the last two years taking care of some of the lower priority projects. With the August election, Series one will only be $32 million, um, but that would be spent in the first two years. So roughly about $16 million a year for the first two years. So a little bit less than what we originally planned. Um, but then when series two kicks in in 2023, um, that would probably be the biggest year of the bond program. That would be our catch up year to get back on track from the original plan in May. So 
Um, it is still possible to complete everything and do everything. It just would be slightly delayed. We'd have to prioritize what projects happened in the first two years. And we have information on what our thoughts are on that. Um, so last slide, this is just a cost summary. This shows us what we, these are the exact same numbers as before. Just kind of shows you how you get from the product totals down to the, what would be the bond cost um, when you factor in the issuance costs and interest earnings. So any questions so far before I jump into some scheduled documents? All right. Hearing none, I'll jump into the schedule. So as just as to what I mentioned, the series one would be $32 million over the first two years, and then series two would be the balance over the final three years. So it's a five-year program. Um, so what we're gonna share with you is the information and the work that we did, um, both the administrative team and with FPC to try to prioritize what products happened in the first two series and balance that out with what would happen in the later series. Um, this isn't 100% set in stone. We can change this as things come up and as priorities may shift over the next six months to a year, we can move projects back and forth, but we definitely wanted to make sure we had a workable solution before we brought this forward to the board so they clearly understood what would happen in the first couple of years. So starting with the project additions, um, what we looked at is that the district is still growing, so we do still need the additions to be at Bartlett and Salem, that's where they're planned to, to right size those buildings, the same size as the rest of the buildings in the district. But we feel we can put the Salem addition off into that second series and just build the classroom additions at Bartlett to start. Um, and that should still work out with the amount of students that we're projecting to grow over the next several years. Uh, the other difference, uh, one of the biggest projects in the entire bond is the pool replacement at the high school. Um, the way that schedule works out, that would actually straddle the two series. So half of that would be done in series one and half would be done in series two. And that lets us balance those, those large dollars between the two series without overburdening series one. On the project building side, um, we had to really look at what was priorities here. We felt that the additional space at East by renovating some of the interior classrooms or interior spaces in the classrooms was a high priority to deal with the space need right now at East. Um, but we also felt that the science rooms at the high school were very important to renovate those up in the first series. By doing so, it moved the media center projects at both high schools back into the second series, as though those would more than likely happen in 2023. So about a year later than we originally planned, but only a year later. But allows us to move forward some of the other projects first. The other part of the building um, that we had to look at was the infrastructure needs. These are things like the roofs, boilers, and parking lots, in this case, the roofs and boilers. Um, we really looked at what we could really stretch out um, one extra year is really what this meant. So there were projects we really, these are things that the community might not see, but these are things that are critical to keeping the buildings running. So we wanted some projects that would be up in the first series, but we felt the majority of that we could stretch out and put into series two. A lot of it was in series two in the past, but we're gonna kind of keep that there. The lighting upgrades was one of the biggest things that we moved. We originally had some of that up front to recognize those operational savings earlier on, um, but unfortunately you just couldn't get that to work and we moved that into series two. So we still would see those operational savings. They would just be about a year later than we originally planned. Going into the site work, um, what we did is we looked at what projects needed to be done for the most part, we left the paving projects um, to be some of us split. There are some parking lots that are in real rough shape, other ones that are, um, we're starting to weather. Tonight you approved two of the critical items we wanted to take care of. So those will be done before this bond program happens. Um, we felt the turf field at both the softball and baseball fields were the highest priority. Just because in the past, we've had to really compromise the season by not being able to play on those fields. Um, but we did feel that the additional multi-purpose turf field that was gonna happen at both high schools could get put off into 2023 because that wasn't as mission critical to the athletics as the um, baseball and softball fields. The East turf would still be replaced in the first series, would probably be one of the very first products out of the gate because um, that field is getting towards the, um, only having a couple of years of remaining life left on that. And then kind of rounding out some of the other projects we had in there, um, technology wise, um, Obviously, this is very, very topical. This is 
uh, probably one of the most important things in here. So we've worked with Chester to um, look at what would have to happen in the first two years of devices and other infrastructure needs to make sure to maintain this. Um, and then what, what really happens is a lot of the devices that are purchased in the first two years keep things moving. And we had to move off a little bit of the infrastructure upgrades for technology into that second series into 2023. Uh, we also kind of split the buses between the two series and moved the administration building into series two. So we felt that the school buildings were a little higher priority than the administration building, even though those needs are not going to go away at the admin building. Um, we're just going to put those off one more year. Um, so that's overall how we line things up so that you'll see that series one, um, that's our $32 million. And then series two is the balance of that $98 million bond program. And again, this is going to be very much of a bell curve. We'll start off with um, a couple years by year three in 2023. Um, we may be looking at doing about $30 million of the work in that year. And then it will tail off towards the end of the bond program. Any questions on those project items? Anything you want me to go back on before I wrap up with some timeline information? Um, I would like to mention um, in your first slide, Jeff, you didn't specifically make mention, but I know there's a lot of public comment about the gym at East. The gym is in the um, bond. It's in series one, so it will happen early. And it was not something we were ever looking to take off. Um, so it's not in your highlighted blue section, but if you look at that first slide, it is on there. It's in series one and we are looking to do an auxiliary gym at East. So I know, like um, Ms. Hanshaw said, there's a lot of public comment about that. Um, and I've seen a lot of public comment um, in the unofficial places as well. Yeah. All right, thank you. Mr. Abate? Either. Thank you. Uh, real quickly, I, I've seen, a just kind of adding to what Ms. Nertel mentioned, I've seen a fair amount of public comment out there about the, the fields and the, and the turf and so on, um, uh, various opinions about it, about the need. You mentioned having to compromise uh, the season because of the current fields. Could you elaborate just a little bit on, um, you know, what the field situation is now and, and why the, the upgrade is necessary? Sure. Um, so for the, the biggest issue, the, actually the one that's in the worst condition would be the varsity baseball field at the high school. Um, it's a drainage issue. So as, as you know, the spring season is always a very wet season um, and that field is very unplayable. So two years ago, or I guess it would be 2019, um, was one of the more rainy seasons. And because the drainage out there is very poor, the fields are just unplayable, was not safe for people to be on there without ripping up the field or possibly injuring themselves. The turf fields drain automatically. If you've been on the football field, you understand how well they drain. So those fields will be usable nearly year round, um, short of the snow being on there. So that'll allow a lot more um, opportunities to play those. Those seasons will be a lot longer. Um, I also know last year that there were some playoffs going on during the week of finals in some other districts. So it was a very challenging year last year. Um, this year, unfortunately, was, was a lost season for other reasons, but we definitely didn't want to compromise that. Uh, moving forward, we want those ball fields to be usable uh, as much as possible. And they also can be used for other sports. Um, you know, you can practice on there. If there were some other teams that are looking for some space outside of the baseball or softball season, you can practice on that, which is the exact same type of turf that is on the football field. Kerry, we have uh, Greg Michaels and Mike Teagan with us on the live stream, I guess, or the phone, if you'd like any further feedback from them on the field. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If we can get some comments. Just to piggyback on what Jeff said, uh, speaking from East, the specifically the football field is coming to its the end of its life expectancy. We are facing, um, you know, as as the thaw came, we had some drainage issues. Uh, there's mounding, um, it's freezing, the understructure is having, you know, is challenged considerably right now with the draining. And that's a big thing, not only the turf, but the understructure is not draining properly, um, which then displaces all the rubber granules and causes performance issues. But the football field's coming to 
the end of its life expectancy, and there are starting to see some performance issues with it. The baseball and softball field, um, Mike's going to speak to South Lion, but there's a significant drainage issue at South Lion. But what I see at East is the the user groups were outnumbered by the user groups right now. And the wear and tear on the grass practice fields um, and the demand for the grass practice fields are significant, not only by our East teams that are full at almost every level um, in the fall and in the spring, there's a demand from the outside user groups, whether it's softball leagues, baseball leagues, we have Huron Valley Lacrosse using it extensively now, and um, they have increased their use in, in the last couple of years. The Panther organization has also um, moved their practices over to East to balance both South Lion, uh, practices at South Lion and at East. We take all the cheerleaders and the Palmers as well. So we are loaded up in the fall. And then there's a demand for youth softball, youth fall softball leagues and baseball leagues. And if you come to um, on any given night in the fall, every practice field is being used. Um, our stadiums are, are maxed out. But by adding turf, let me get to the point, by adding turf, it reduces the amount of wear and tear and we can displace other groups in a good way and put them on that turf in the off seasons when baseball isn't going on or softball isn't going on. Or, you know, when we get those weather days and since I've been at East, we have not played a baseball game or a softball game in the month of March. And we always try to do that. And we aren't starting until after spring break. My Upper Peninsula, Northern Michigan people, colleagues will laugh at me and say, quit crying. But downstate people want to get 32 games in, 36 games in. And um, recently, uh, last spring, we got washed out. We were hosting the district um, baseball finals, and we were washed out. We weren't able to get the fields ready. Our grounds people did a, an amazing job. We put a lot of money into it with um, turfus and, and and turf dry type items and they, they raked it out and they tried to groom it and get it ready. We couldn't get it ready. And we had to move the championship games over to Novi. Why Novi? Novi has turf. And um, it's a nice product. And again, I think with our community growth and all those youth groups, the added turf on the baseball softball field allow that to be used um, at its fullest potential. Thank you. Mr. Teagan. Hey, Kerry, it's Mike. Just add on yep. to Jeff. Yes, yes, how you doing? Um, just to add, it's the same thing. It's all flat line high. Jeff's and Greg's, the fields are at the end of their useful life. Our drainage issues are immense. The amount of water that our fields hold uh, just with the soils in that area are certainly uh, impair the drainability and playability of those fields. You know, people would ask, well, why, why go to turf? Um, because turf is going to give you that year-round ability to use it in the fall and spring, make it a multi-purpose space that you can practice um, a lacrosse team, a, band, a football team, a soccer team, a panther or your cheerleaders on because you have a field that can handle the wear and tear no matter if it's wet, dry, hot, or cold out. Um, so the Southland High Fields are just they're at a point where we have to address them. Uh, turf is the natural uh, fix on a lot of pieces to be able to make them more playable um, and, and really give what, you know, give all of our kids in all of our community access to those types of facilities. All right, thank you. President Hanshaw? Yes. Yes, if I could, uh, Jeff, uh, Board Member Clark, have you done an analysis of where you think the economy is going to be? And I know that's a long stretch and needs a crystal mm -hmm. ball, but what are we facing here or the potential for facing in August with this millage election? Where do you sure. think? Yeah, we, we were. Go ahead. Yeah, 
yeah, we've, we've done this. We've had some districts um, approach us regarding work that they were planning on doing next year and whether or not to bid that out now or to look at some delays or what that might be. Um, right now, there is a lot of pent-up demand. Um, there is still a lot of work out there. People are anxious to go back to work. So we don't see a, a huge drop-off in the construction market. We still think it will be busy. Um, there may be some some areas um, – you know, we know that gas prices are at almost all time lows right now, um, comparatively. So there might be some paving savings down the road. That may be why our paving number we got recently was was very low. So it'll be some things that the district will be able to, I hate to say the word, take, take advantage of, but there'll be some things the district will benefit on in the future because the, there'll be some savings for it. But there's a lot of other areas that we don't predict too much of a change um, as far as the, the cost of construction because there is still a, somewhat of a labor shortage out there. And people are looking to. Uh, there's a lot of work out there. Okay, I, I was kind of primarily looking for the what do you feel the sentiment of the voters are going to be. Oh, given the state of the economy uh, or potential state sorry, of the sorry. economy in the fall. Okay, no, sorry about that. I was, I was answering another question I'd heard from somebody else before. Um, you know, as far as going for an August election, um, yes, there are, there probably are some people that are going to be a little bit um, tighter with their their belts right now because of. Um, that may be in a position where they've they've lost their job and they're uh, they're running short on funds. Um, so there is going to be a little bit of that. Um, the situation that South Lion has, um, these products, a lot of them don't go away, um, and, and all the products would increase in cost. So where it might might be a little bit of a tough, the the tougher thing is to not do it. Um, may cause some ramifications in the classroom with operational funds and and reduction of services. So. We still do have, there'll still be about 30 elections. Previously, there were about 50 elections going in May. Once this thing all hit, about 30 of them moved to August. Um, some stayed with May, and some are going to be looking to, a few are going to be looking to bump to November. Um, but we still see a, a lot of people are going to be going out for elections. They still feel that it's the right thing to do to bring these things forward to the voters in August. Could you speak to the ramifications if this uh, proposal were to fail? How long does it take the district to recover and, and try again? Um, the, the requirements would be you, you um, have to call for election 12 weeks prior to the election dates, and those are only three or four times a year. So you could not go to a November election. I think you're going to be just short of getting to November. Um, your, your next best choice would be the May of 21 election. You could definitely bring forward there. Um, I have to do the math in my head to know if you could make the November election or not. Because you're doing non-qualified, most school districts go qualified, which means you have to go through Treasury, which adds a step here. Because you're not doing that, you can very quickly go back to the voters um, within that 12-week window. Okay. Um, President Hanshaw, are you taking board um, comments at this time, or are we still President listening Hanshaw, to presentation mode? Or? Yeah, does anyone have any other questions for Jeff specifically regarding the presentation? Uh, I, do. I would like to add on real quick to um, the end of Jeff's answer there. Uh, we did discuss that in the FPC committee before um, agreeing to bring it to the board. And one of the key points in us moving forward is the fact that um, the way the numbers are looking with the um, repackaging of the series one and series two information is that we're, you know, we are asking for the bonding, but it shouldn't result in a tax increase due to where things are and where the existing debt is falling off. So even though the economy might be tight, we're not necessarily asking people to raise taxes. It'll just be a, you know, a, a continuation of the rate they've already been, been paying for the past several years. Actually, the, their taxes will go down um, July 1, um, um, and we will not be increasing from the tax decrease by one. So they will see a little bit of a de tax decrease this summer. And if it passes in August, it will not increase yet, um, past what it what it decreased in July. So they will still be seeing a slight tax decrease in July. Thank you, Stacy. And I think George, did you have a comment regarding the project? I, I do, I have a couple. Okay. Um, one was just to remind everybody what Stacy just did, the tax rate is going to decline in uh, June, whether we go forward with this or not, and there won't be any impact on that tax decline uh, when this passes. The second, I'm going to remind you, these projects are valid and necessary. 
Um, they, they were valid and necessary when we were going in May, uh, and they continue to be valid and necessary. And by switching those, the timing within those two series, you're going to get a lot of bang for your buck. But I think the most important thing that's happened to us now is that you've got an opportunity to protect your general fund. And I think the community is going to want to do that with you. This You're not going to have the same level of per pupil support from the state of Michigan in next year's budget uh, that we expect to have or that we hope to have uh, given the situation. I think the community would be anxious in August to come out and celebrate something and say yes to something good knowing that they're protecting dollars for the classroom instruction. Um, and that's what a yes vote on this will do for the community. Thanks. Okay, any other comments specifically to the presentation itself? Oh, Dan, Mr. Swigler. Hi. Um, so since things are being kind of pushed off a little bit and reorganized within the series, and I may be totally off base here, but I assume series one is the more critical things, the things that just have to be done. And obviously it's timely. So we're going to get those done first. If we really are, I, I'm concerned about the economy and I'm concerned about people wanting to vote yes on spending money on the district if things get worse. And we don't know what it's going to be like in August, but it's not, we don't know where the bottom is of this yet. Um, is it feasible to only really work on those things in the series one, and then depending on when the economy rebounds, come back and ask for the rest of it? Is that even an option that we should consider or can consider? If they're not gonna be, if the work's not gonna be done for two more years, starting in 2023, but it was approved by then, I, I don't know if the costs increase to get those projects done at the exact same time with a second bond and a short turnaround. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, I think I understand what you're saying. So it would be, you're, you're thinking if, they, if you did a two votes, you did vote, one vote now for those first series and then came back to the voters in 2022, say, to do the work for 2023. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, whether even, and maybe even in May of 21, when we know, we just know, okay, you know what? It was a sharp drop, it was a quick rebound. So next May we ask for the rest of it right away, or maybe we have to wait another year to ask for the rest of it. Either of those scenarios. I'm just, I'm, I'm worried about the passability in August. Although I fully agree with everything on there. I'm just concerned about whether or not people are going to vote for it in its current package, if that makes sense. So yeah, I'd like to know if that's even an option. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there would be an option. Um, you know, there would be some, some duplication of costs because you'd be looking at, running two campaigns. Um, so there is some some campaign costs in there. I'm sure there's some some election or costs and issues costs that you, you would have to duplicate. Um, in the scheme of things, in a $98 million bond, it's probably not huge, but there's some duplication of effort there. Um, it, it may be mostly effort is, is that this, there'd be, um, you know, the district does put a large effort into the campaign. So going back out, you know, the citizens are doing a whole lot of campaign process. So. That would be one of my concerns is that level of effort being duplicated um, in a short time afterwards. Um, but yes, it would be possible um, you could run two campaigns. You do get voter fatigue. Sometimes people, we, we don't often run elections um, back to back or you know a couple of years apart from each other. You know, Usually it's a minimum of five years apart from election just because you don't, if you go to them, you're gonna, um, you're gonna be asking them to vote again. And there's there's just a voter fatigue factor to that, that people don't wanna approve something because you've already asked them for something and you got your hand out again. So, and, and I'm gonna push, someone. excuse me, Jeff, I was just gonna say, I'm gonna push back a little bit. There will be some increased pressure on series one then uh, to spend that $32 million in, in different ways because you've got some of that money, Dan, bridging over to series, series one and series two and people were comfortable with some of those decisions, but I'm not sure anybody would put off a, a pool redesign and rebuild at South Lyon High School uh, completely out of the bond issue if you were hoping to get that passed in two years. And if you pull all that forward into series one, you you put a lot of pressure on series one. So it would, it, it would have to be a redesign of 32 to $35 million, I guess is what I'm saying. 
Uh, George, I'm actually, this is, uh, Member Clark, I'm actually more comfortable with that because I think coming out to the public in August with the possibility of a severe economic environment, um, I, I would be more inclined to say they would be willing to pass something that band-aids all the roofs, the boilers, the things that we have severe issues with. I think the public would support that. I'm concerned that they're going to think some of these items may be frivolous. Um, that we know they're not frivolous, they're desirable. But just this evening, the uh, governor of Ohio came out and said they're looking at a school start with just two days in person per week and three days online. And I think if we don't adjust our request to meet some of the environment, our public is not going to be happy just saying we're going to throw all that money at the sports facilities. So I'm, I'm, I'm starting to wonder if we should incorporate more technology for online learning. I mean, that's, that's going to be something that everybody's going to be demanding by the time we get to fall. Okay, any more specific questions to the presentation? Okay, so let's, I guess now we can just specifically talk about the actual action of the resolution. Anyone have any comments specifically to the resolution before we vote? I think at this point, I, I can't support a 98 million request. To, I think the economy is headed, like Dan has said, probably into a much worse place than we can envision at this point, given the amount of layoffs we've had and how long it's going to take these companies to reboot and rehire. Um, I just don't see how that we're going to get a positive vote. And I, I'm worried that if we come out with this full request and it goes down, it, we, it may take a year or two for us to recover from that and go back to the community. I would submit that I think now, it, I think it makes things a little more difficult, but I still look at it as a, if we build it, they will come kind of approach. If we don't do this, I think the ramifications two, three, four years down the road face us more severely than our challenge now occurs to, to have this election. I think putting it off doesn't do us any more good. The things that were on the bond that are in this program a year and a half ago when we first started looking at what we wanted and what we needed to do um, are still the same things that were in the package that we were going to vote for in May. They're still the same things that are in the package that we need to have to move forward and be more of a leader in education, in our facilities, and in what we do going forward into August and beyond that. Um, so I understand that it's a big decision. It's a tough call to ask somebody to vote for it or not. But if we set the tone and the message that this is the right thing to do, this is how we're going to push things forward and give you the the things in the district that the community has asked for and has wanted, um, I think we need to do it. Thank you. Mr. Abate? Thank you. Thank you. I was trying to unmute there, sorry. Um, I, I think Mr. Clark and Mr. Swegler make, some, make a really strong point. I personally, um, I'm quite nervous about its prospect for passage for the same reason. Um, however, I think some really key things came out of this presentation here. Um, one, the fact is we, we know we need these things. There, there's not, there, there aren't luxury items in this bond and there's there's an overemphasis on 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 folks pointing at the athletic piece of it when we're talking about roughly 10 percent or so 10 to 12 percent of, of the total amount we and and we've heard tonight really specific reasons why we need those things for the safety of our kids it's meaningful to the community but i think what's really significant here uh, the points that stacy and george brought up uh, we're going to be spending if we don't do this we know we need it. We don't do it. We're going to spend money out of our general fund, which is going to be smaller. I think the fact, a gigantic point that swung me uh, I, just in the last few minutes, because I honestly didn't know which way. I've been struggling with this uh, up to up to tonight. 
Um, the idea that our taxes are actually going to go down and we can still do this, they'll go down. We don't have to raise from, from that, that point and still get the work done that we need to get done for our kids is a really huge point. But I, I, you know, I can't argue with, with the other two gentlemen. I, I am nervous despite all of that um, about its passage, but I can't, I can't see not supporting this for our kids. Thank you, Mr. Dashner. So um, again, I'll echo a lot of what Tony says. Um, I don't think it's as easy as saying we want to do um, just what's in series one. Um, you know, as part of building up what all was involved in this, um, a big piece of it is we've got, it's, I forget what the exact number is, but we've got close to $40 million in needs that relate to buildings, um, parking lots, you know, HVAC systems, stuff like that. So if we were try to go back to the uh, drawing board and try to whittle it down to the things that were necessary, um, you know, physically necessary to keep the buildings in good shape, I think we're still asking for more than that $32 million that we've got series one down to now. So either we're leaving stuff behind that needs to be done that isn't gonna get done, or we're going back and we're asking for less money than we're asking now, but more money than what series one is, which probably puts in a, in a position where we're gonna be raising taxes instead of keeping it at zero tax, at least for that first series. Um, I, I understand the concerns with the total. Um, I just, it, it's hard to say no to it based off of concerns what it could be. Uh, none of us know where the economy is gonna go. Um, I, I just, for me, it was, it came down to the fact that we're not going to raise taxes and we're able to do this. Um, and there's probably somebody else that could speak to it better, but if we decide not to go forward with this tonight, um, I think that's going to force us to miss the August election. And then we would be back to a point of trying to recategorize this and figure out what we want to do, which would put us at least to a November uh, election and then possibly into next year. So I mean, there's a lot of moving parts to it. I mean, I support it in its current form. Um, I, I just think the needs are out there. And like Tony said, yeah, it looks heavy on the athletics, but you know, if we were to compare um look at the baseball fields there's a lot of work that needs to be done to those regardless of whether we put synthetic turf on them or not so you know do you spend half or three quarters as much money just trying to um get the drainage fixed out there and put them back in grass and not get the benefit of the turf um or you know do you just do it and the same thing could be said for the pool at south line high school you know, a lot of the mechanical equipment's at the end of its useful life. So do we go and spend a few million dollars to get the mechanical equipment back online? Um, you know, do some, call it aesthetic work around the pool with the tile and stuff like that and have $4 million into a pool that's still not, you know, useful for the entire function. I mean, that's, that's the kind of feedback loop we get stuck in with a lot of this uh, stuff if we try to pair it out. Mr. Swagler? Uh, yeah, just a couple quick questions. One, does anybody have any sort of information on when bonds are generally more successful? I know you really want to try to avoid the November ones, but do we have better, a better opportunity to pass a bond in its current form in August versus November, historically speaking for school districts? Can anyone speak to that? Jeffrey? Anyone? the question i don't know generally school districts usually try for may which is uh, i think has been the most successful for districts uh in the past that's that's yeah. really I, that's the only generalization i can make yeah i'm with Mr. Yeah. there's another stat that people look at there's another stat that people look at right. uh, um it, a no tax rate increase election is about a 90 percent success rate where if it is a tax increase, um, it moves down to about a 60% success rate. So that is usually the more important factor versus when to go for elections. Um, August typically isn't hugely popular. Um, you know, May is usually more popular, uh, but the, the reason for that is because a May election, you can do work the next year and get a lot of work done, where an August election, you start to reduce the amount of work you can do that following year. So August is just not as popular 
success rate wise, it's um, it's probably a little less successful successful than May, but not substantially. What about November? How does it compare to November elections? Uh, November's are, are very hit and miss. It, it's always very tied to the politics of things. So, um, you know, th this November with the politics that you know, are where they are, you're not going to get a whole lot of attention uh, with your campaign. So that's a concern. And does anybody know in South Lines history, I was trying to find some information online about having those back-to-back -back bonds in our bond history. There's just, it's not easy to find that information. The only thing I could find is October of 97, it looks like we had one passed, and I think December of 99, where there were back-to-back -back bonds. December of 99, where there were back-to-back -back yep. bonds. Uh, yeah, that's right. correct. Uh, we and we and did I have a failure in the early 90s also, and it took a couple of years to rebound from that. I... Again, I just want to be clear. I do support the bond. I just want to make sure that we have our best chance of success, whether that's in its current form in August, or if we have to consider splitting it, or November, whatever the case may be. I just want to make sure we have our best chance to get this through. Okay. Uh, Ms. Hertel? Yeah, um, I support the bond um, and everything that um, Mr. Bate and Mr. Dasher and Mr. Kennedy had, had spoken about. And I guess one thing that I kind of want to tack into there is, um, you know, I, I like the fact that, you know, we're not doing a tax increase, that we've been able to shift the series um, and the projects. But if you look at the um, spreadsheet, there's a lot of projects that um, bridge the series. Um, so, you know, again, like what um, Mr. Dasher was talking about, how do you then redecide what's in series one? But I guess another thought that I had is, is not only, you know, um, you know, I understand the concern about the economy, but, you know, by passing the bond, we could be helping the economy by making sure that for the next five years, we have multiple construction companies and subcontractors able to employ um, you know, employees and workers and trades over the next five years in putting into our buildings and, you know, from either a performance standpoint or an overall maintenance standpoint. So, you know, you could be doing multiple things with this bond of just overall improvement of our facilities, safety of the facilities. Um, and there is technology in this um, bond, you know, laptop or Chromebooks for all the ninth graders coming in, um, enhanced Wi-Fi capabilities for those items, um, you know, infrastructure additions for, you know, the, the community that we have that's growing from classrooms to the science classrooms at um, South Line High School. Um, but, and then, you know, the, the benefit of reducing taxes in July and then a no tax increase in August, but guaranteeing and showing that we're helping the community by our infrastructure, the schools, and employing um, contractors and tradesmen for the next five years working on these projects. Great. Uh, anyone else have any comments? Um, I will also just reiterate kind of what everyone has said. Um, to me, the big thing that I've just noticed during this whole pandemic is how much our community loves our schools, our teachers, um, all of our support staff, um, the way that school has really come together to really handle this in the best way we can. And I think people are looking forward to getting back into the schools and into the football fields and into the pools for swim lessons. And I think um, they're gonna want that stuff all ready for them when it, when it can be. So. Um, I think that if we can do this without a tax increase, um, that I think we need to go ahead and do it. But, um, with that, if no one has any more questions or comments. President Hanshaw, please. Yep. Uh, I, I just want to make it clear that I, I am very supportive of, of the things that are in this proposal, but it, I cannot in good conscience support it in its present form. If it was like half this amount and it took care of the the critical infrastructure issues, I would I would support it. 
or if we delayed the whole bond request until May when we had a better handle on the economy, I would support that. But I think moving forward the way we are with uh, the unknowns coming at us in the economy, I think uh, is, is probably a, a, a severe error. So I'll, I'll be opposing this present bond issue. I agree. Um, I just don't know that if, if the economy fails as much as some people are anticipating, um, if it'll be any better by next May. Um, but yet our roofs are still going to need to be repaired and our right. driveways are still going to be repaired need to be right. fixed. So, and, and that's why I would support a, a modified half amount or whatever to, to get, take care of that. But we, we okay. can debate it all night, but go ahead. Okay. Um, with that, Mr. Mm -hmm. Um, please call the roll. Okay, Mr. Tell. Yes. Ms. Hanshaw. Yes. Mr. Schwegler. I didn't want to go third. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just mixing the order, Mr. Schwegler. Uh, I think the the sentiment of the board is going to be to do it, and I'm going to support the board as a whole, so I will vote yes. Mr. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Clark. No. Mr. Dasher. Yes. And I vote yes. Okay, um, motion passes six to one. Okay, item 14, Kids Read Now purchase. Yes, Kids Read Now is a supplemental summer literacy program. Families of students in kindergarten through third grade will receive books mailed to their home throughout the summer over a six week period with reading tips for families and families do get to keep those books. The program is designed to increase student access to books at their level and in their interest areas. And the program is only offered for students in kindergarten through third grade. So I know we already had some questions from staff about, is it possible to include fourth and fifth graders or junior kindergarten students? It is only available for kindergarten through third grade from the vendor. Earlier this year, we applied for and received funds for a 35A grant to cover the costs of this summer reading initiative. Our initial grant application includes a request for funds for all students in kindergarten through third grade who were on reading improvement plans, and they would have received those Kids Read Now services. However, given the closure of in-person instruction and the closure of local libraries at the time being, we are recommending that the program in our district be expanded to include all of our students in kindergarten through third grade. The 35A grant is covering $53,680 of the total cost. And our CETA department budget will cover the remaining $12,910, which will allow us to include all of the students in kindergarten through third. A change in the vendor's production timelines, however, necessitates bringing this item for action instead of just information this evening. Uh, we are still hoping to work with the vendor to have this roll out beginning in June rather than beginning um, the first week in May. So we can extend to the amount of time students have um, literacy materials in their hands. They already were sent home with some when school closed. Um, so we would ideally like it to, to stretch into summer, um, but the vendor timelines right now uh, begin with the first week in May for students receiving the books. So we are recommending that you approve the purchase of Kids Read Now for the use of students in kindergarten through third grade, beginning potentially in May for a cost of $66,590.50. Do we have a motion? So moved, Clark. I'll support. Moved by Mr. Clark, supported by Mr. Schwagler. Any questions or comments? I just want to say it's a good thing that you applied for this grant <laughs> up front. It worked out well. It really did. So, all right, Mr. Bobby, please call the roll. Okay, I vote yes. Mr. Clark? Yes. Mr. Dashner? Yes. Mr. Schwagler? Yes. Mr. Kennedy? Yes. Mr. Tell? Yes. And Ms. Hanshaw. Mm -hmm. yeah. Motion passes seven to zero. Um, item 18 is administration. And A is food service update. So food service update. All children under the age of 18 and special education students under the age of 26 are eligible to receive a bagged breakfast and lunch for the duration of the school closure. Children do not have to be registered with South Lyon Community Schools to participate. South Lyon Community Schools began distributing food on Wednesday, March 18th, 2020. The food service department prepares bags that contain seven breakfasts and seven lunch lunches in each bag. 
The bags of food are being distributed once a week on Wednesdays to families that are in need. There is a central pickup location at South Lyon High School where families in need can come and pick up food bags from the district. Buses are also loaded with bags and transported to other areas in the district with the highest needs for our families to pick up. Staff, staff trained in food preparation prepare and package the meals and meals are distributed by food service staff, non-food non service district employees and volunteers. The district will continue to provide breakfast and lunch meals as necessary until the date of the executive order expires. The school messenger notification system, which includes emails, texts, and phone messages, has been used to communicate with families ab about the food service program. Other communication tools include the, the district's social media sites and district websites. As an added effort to enhance communication, building administration administrators also reached out to families to ensure all children who need food were aware of the program. District food service staff will continue to prepare these meal bags and, distrib and distribute to families on a weekly basis until June 12th of 2020. All right, uh, Mr. Dashner. Yeah, I just wanna um, thank everyone that was involved with that food service program. Uh, it amazes me how quickly they were able to pull it together and the number of meals they put together. Um, see a lot of teachers and volunteers and food workers, and it's it's impressive what they've done. And I like seeing the changes of putting food on bus and take it to neighborhoods to make it easier to get to. So I just want to say thank you to everyone involved. Yes, uh, definitely a shout out. Thank you to uh, Miss Sherry Trent. She's the uh, food service coordinator, and um, her and her team have done a phenomenal job. And our teachers and all of the other volunteers, um, we really appreciate it. And uh, I agree, it happened very quickly and uh, very effectively. So very good job with that. Um, okay, uh, next is uh, the letter of agreement with Teamsters, Mr. Kirby. All right, thank you. And uh, directly related to the work of the uh, food service department and the many people that helped pull that together and, and made, made it uh, go off with the success. We had a couple of letters of agreement that I wanted to share with the board. Uh, the first one, and that was, they were an enclosure, the first one, enclosure 12, uh, the continuation of active God day pay. Uh, just wanted to share with you in the contract, the Teamster contract, it basically allows uh, active God pay for five days. And our food service workers, our uh, custodians and our building engineers um, there's a, st a stipulation in how it's compensated uh, with active God days. If we would have followed the contract, we would have ceased the um, compensation after five days. And we've worked, uh, they have worked diligently well beyond that. So I approached them and asked them, um, and obviously they were, they were uh, supportive of it, but we wanted to continue that active God pay um, as long as we could uh, while we were under the stay home order in our, um, you know, cancellation of school. So they went ahead and they signed that. Um, and, you know, like I said, it was a benefit to our employees, but we really felt like it was the right thing to do as they were, you know, putting themselves in harm's way. And frankly, our food service staff that started had no idea where they were going to be at as far as compensation. The team that got pulled together um, jumped in because they, they wanted to fulfill their moral imperative to feed the children. And uh, they, they did that. And then uh, I was very glad we were able to put that um, in place so that we could compensate them for their, for their efforts. So that was the first one. Anybody have any questions on that particular letter of agreement? That will expire at the end of the year and end of this. Um, that one's already expired April 5th. Okay. And then the next one, uh, was a another letter of agreement with the Teamsters who've just been uh, you know wonderful in working uh, through this and, and quite frankly our entire district has been very collaborative uh, working together to make sure that we're feeding and educating the kids. Uh, the Teamsters represents the bus drivers, food service uh, custodians, building engineers, and within their contract it's very specific on who does what duties. And um, I also approached the Teamster group uh, to work once we got this. Uh, latest executive order where we needed to deploy our staff in a, a meaningful way. 
this group, uh, they aren't going to uh, be assisting within our uh, continuity of learning plans, but they are going to be assisting with our uh, food plans. So in short, what this letter of agreement um, provides is it allows our managers to schedule cross classification. So for example, last Wednesday, when I went to South Lyon High School, the uh, transportation department was basically our bus drivers and, and the transportation department where they were the ones that were helping um, helping get all of the food in the bags. Uh, they were helping get the food in the vehicles. And those were our bus drivers that were out there doing that. If we wouldn't have had that letter of agreement in place, they couldn't have been assigned to uh, do work in the food service uh, realm. So what they've done is they've allowed us to do cross classification. So our bus drivers could also help with uh, cleaning out lockers, for example, down the road, if that's the situation. So we're really looking to try to create some flexibility with this uh, very um, you know, talented group of staff and the Teamsters and just utilize them in different ways. And they were agreeable to that. So they're to be commended um, as well as, you know, many of our staff, but this particular uh, unit um, was more than willing to sign these two letters of agreement to help out um, as best possible. And, and they really need to be commended for that. So I wanted to make sure that you are aware of their uh, willingness to do that. Uh, Mr. Kirby, for the second one, does that one also expire at the end of the school year, when does that one expire? Yeah, this one, uh, this is a one-time non-precedent setting agreement and it went into effect on April 13th mm -hmm. uh, and that will expire on June 30th. Okay. Of this year. Of this year, okay. Yes, that's right. the actual official uh, end of the school year, just not knowing how we were all gonna, you know, this would all unfold, we use that particular date. Okay, yeah, we definitely appreciate their willingness to step up and help out all right, any other questions or comments from anyone? Okay, um, let's move on to the um, board policy res regulation adoption. Yes, thank you. I have that one as well. Uh, just a little bit of background as a, as a reminder, as the Board of Ed decided on December 3rd, 2018 with, to partner with Lusk and Albertson to create district board policies and administrative regulations. Uh, the policy committee has been working with Kevin Sutton to create the policies and administrative regulations for the district. The committee has been reviewing and revising both documents since the decision was made in December of 2018. When members were absent from the committee meetings, they had an opportunity to meet uh, and meet with me and provide their input for uh, consideration. Uh, the initial implementation was targeted for second semester 2019-2020 uh, due to the unforeseen uh, superintendent vacancy and the work necessary around the bond decision, the Board of Education agreed to revise the target date to be fall of 2020. Um, I did provide you our copies, uh, draft uh, version seven of the policies that you got that in early March to start reviewing. Um, we, again, we did a lot of work through the committees, uh, made a lot of revisions. Um, as I explained um, in the message when I sent it to you, we gave you all the markups so you could see the work that was done uh, by all of our committee members. Uh, after we made the uh, draft um, policies, we also went through and made regulations that met um, all of the requirements of the policies. And while doing that, we had, again, input from the committee members. We had uh, input from uh, central office administrators, building administrators. We spent a day with Kevin on November 14th uh, to kind of try to um, get some final um, verbiage on our uh, administrative regulations. And that allowed us to uh, make some solid um, contributions. And one of the things that this board really wanted was to have the South Lion um, unique um, ideas in them. And we've really done a nice job with that. And you can see um, with all of the markups, the different colors and the different versions that we've continued to um, you know, modify and make sure that it represents um, South Lion Community Schools. So I wanted to bring these uh, tonight for information. Uh, and I certainly will entertain any questions. Um, so I guess, Carrie, how would you like to proceed with this? Do so you want to answer, take questions, or I, I wasn't going to go through, you know, the entire policy. Everybody's had all of those, um, but how? What other information would the uh, group like? Yeah. Does anyone have any specific questions or comments? I know, um, like you said, Mr. Sutton is here as well. Um, if you have any um, questions for him, um, I'm assuming everyone had an opportunity to re review everything. Um, so, if anyone would like to speak, let me know. Uh, President Hanshaw, please. 
Yes, Mr. Clark. I just would like the uh, uh, board members to please take uh, close attention to the sections regarding board bylaws. That's a section that we have never uh, in the history of Southline had before. So I, I would behoove the members to take a look at that compared to what we have existing in our policies. Um, that's probably my only big comment for, the, for now. Okay. Well, one of the things that I would like to, to mention, I, I and know that Randy had brought up in one of our meetings, um, and it's actually on the policy um, page one, uh, and it is in the bylaws, but there's two options that the board's gonna have to decide on. Uh, and I wanted to bring that forward because when we get to a decision point in our next meeting, it needs to be clear how we're going to proceed. But there's two, there's two options. And if, if you would turn to page one um, for the policies, under 0003, the superintendent of schools, you'll see there's two options. The first one reads, the board may, but is not required to formally approve administrative regulations and then there's another option, the board will formally approve administrative regulations prior to implementation. And if we choose that one, then obviously we wouldn't um, have the language above in, in option one. Uh, the recommendation moving forward would be to select option one. Um, and uh, you know, Kevin spoke to this in our committee meetings. Uh, certainly we can uh, talk further here if you would like uh, about what some advantages would be uh, of that, but that is a um, decision point that would need to be made when we do uh, finalize these uh, at the next board meeting. President Hanshaw, if I may. Yep, uh, this is well, this is one topic that I I spoke rather vehemently uh, about in our policy committee meetings. I felt that uh, this certainly is an obligation of the board and a responsibility of the board to approve how our buildings are operating and how the administration implements the policies and guidelines. So I was in favor of option number two, that the board approve the actual guidelines. And that is why we put in the two options. Uh, and when we spoke uh, amongst the committee, you know, there was, and certainly the other board members that were on the committee certainly can chime in. Uh, what, what we had talked about is the regulations are the actual day-to-day -day operations of the administration and the staff. And what we had talked about doing is with administrative regulation changes, because those are simply um, things that might need to happen uh, expeditiously, is that we would inform the board at policy committee meetings when we were making administrative regulation changes, so the board was aware. Uh, we also have all of the um, policies and regulations will be online, so those would always be available to everybody, so everybody would know what the steps were uh, as well. But Tony and Carrie, certainly if you have other things to add, if you can recall from our discussion, um, that would be great. Yeah, I do remember from just being on policy in the past, um, our district didn't specifically have administrative regulations. Um, they had them in an informal session and um, that's the way it was always done in the past. Um, they were all, not everything, but many things were brought to the board policy committee for discussion um, and information, um, but we didn't vote on those in the past. And so that's why um, most of us felt that option one was appropriate because those were the day-to-day -day regulations. Ms. Hanshaw, if I may. Ms. Tewis. Oh yeah, sorry, Mr. Sutton. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody. And, and thank you for, for letting me join in. I, I just wanna say very quickly, uh, a, a big picture comment and then a more a granular comment. Uh, first off, I, I want to thank everybody on the policy committee, uh, not just the, member, the board members that are on the committee, but the administrators that are on the committee. Uh, they put in a, a ton of work. Uh, you see seven, seven versions of the manual, the policy manual, four or five versions of the administration manual. And, and so everybody, board members included, did a ton of work on this, and Ben especially. Uh, ben has done really a phenomenal job of, of shepherding it down the field. Um, and, and so I just want to publicly thank everybody for their involvement. You can see from the extensive red lines, a lot of contribution, a lot of thought, 
and a lot of effort. Um, I, I, I will leave option one and two for you to debate. What I want to make sure I point out is the sentence that is right before option one or two, because that's important to understand what, what is in our baseline. The baseline is, as, as Ben indicated, option one, but the sentence before that is important. Regulations are to be consistent with these bylaws and policies, except as otherwise agreed by the board, and will not be effective for a period of one month from the date they're provided to the board. So the key there is that the administration, uh, yes, uh, without, without formal board approval, has the ability to make changes quickly without doing a first reading and a second reading and a vote and all that other good stuff. But the idea that they could make changes on a Monday and have them be effective on Tuesday is not what the intention is here in the absence of formal board approval. The intent, and it's obviously very clear there in 0003, is that whatever the administration comes up with from a regulation standpoint to be provided to the board and have it not take effect for a period of, of at least a month. Um, to give the board an opportunity to review it and raise a hand and say, well, wait a second, we don't think this necessarily is what we intended. Uh, we've got a concern with it. And so I, again, uh, the, the merits of one versus two, I will leave certainly to the board to debate, but I wanna make sure that everybody sees that sentence above the options, because I think that's an important component of the dynamic as it relates to approval of, of administrative regulations. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. I also wanted to, if I could, I added in the chat um, column there, I put a website uh, in there from another district that has the Lusk Albertson uh, policies and regulations. And if you, if you wanted to look at it, you certainly, you know, certainly you can. Uh, and basically there's a search engine there. So you can put in, say you put in suspension, every policy and every regulation that deals with suspension would come up. Um, Currently with our South Line created policies that we've had, that we've had over the years when we've made a change, my assistant has had to go in and create a new document, upload it to the website, um, and then they have been sending out uh, paper copies, which we actually halted that uh, some months back, but sending out paper copies and then everybody was, you know, updating their policies and whatnot. But when we make our changes now moving forward, Lusk Albertson, we let them know what our revisions are. They make the changes and it goes on this website. So as soon as we make our approvals, you know, it's not too much longer and it, it's live. We're not, you know, having to spend a lot of different uh, resources and trying to get it to, to all work and juggle and we'll get rid of all the paper products um, that we've utilized over the years as well. So I wanted to make sure to remind everybody about that. All right, thank you. Mr. Dashner? Ooh, I'm good. Kevin touched on what I was going to ask. Oh, okay, Mr. Swagler? Uh, yeah, just a quick question. So in regards to that option one versus option two, if the administration announces they'd like to make a change to regulation and the board does have a concern, can they override the change at that point then formally and say, you know what, we don't like what you're about to do, so don't do it at the next meeting? I make sure my volume is on there. There we go. Um, uh, in, theory, in theory, yes, they certainly could. I think my hope would that be we would never get to that point. I of mean, course. certainly if the board has, has concerns uh, about, about an administrative regulation, um, uh, I would want that to be worked out in advance, and that's why we give the period uh, of a month. I think certainly if, the, if you had an administration that said that they were, um, uh, they were going to do it no matter what you said, uh, the, the use of uh, preventative board action I think would be appropriate, but I, I certainly would hope we would never reach reach that point. I would hope that we would be able to figure it out before we got to that point. But but if not, certainly board formal action uh, to stop whatever the administration was trying to implement would be an, a, an avenue available to the board. Yeah, and and the idea of the um, you know the policy committee as well that would we would be communicating at that point, so we wouldn't be implementing you know, things that would be a surprise basically. And the superintendent would certainly be, um, you know, a first line of communication if there was some concerns with any uh, regulations and whatnot, but that policy committee will still have a function of communication with the board for sure. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so most likely this will be on, uh, the agenda for next month or yeah, the next meeting, correct? For vote? Yes. 
All right. Yeah. So if anyone has any other questions, concerns, comments, please get them to us as soon as possible. Um, okay, next is the uh, preliminary budget, the 2021 preliminary budget. Ms. Witt. Okay, I think I can present now. Bear with me. <laughs> Can everybody see my screen? Yep. Okay. So the um, 2021 preliminary budget presentation is broken up into basic uh, four basic sections. Uh, the first section I'm gonna go over is the state of the state. Then we'll review um, financial information in the 2021 preliminary budget that you guys all have in your enclosure 16. Um, and then we'll discuss some things about South Lyon Community Schools and what that means to our district specifically. And then we'll review some of the financial forecasts that um, come out of this preliminary budget. So first, the state of the state, um, which really nobody knows. In January, um, the governor did come out with a uh, $225, $225 per pupil increase for the bottom uh, per pupil funded districts. Um, that, would have that would have brought the 2021 per pupil foundation up to $8,336 for base funded public school districts. Net increase of 2.77% from this current year's 1920 per pupil foundation. Um, that she also included in her budget that she put out in January before this pandemic hit um, of a total increase for South Lyon Community Schools of at-risk special education and CTE increase of $307,427. So Governor Whitmore's bu budget that she came out in January would have added a total of $2,280,227 to this budget. Um, after reviewing with the Finance Committee, we decided to budget a $114 per pupil um, foundation increase. This number was identified prior to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the budget was began to be built on this 114 per pupil increase. So in this current budget that I'm presenting today, um, it does include the 114 per pupil increase, which would bring our uh, per pupil allocation to $8,225 per pupil. That's a net increase of 999,552 overall and we did not add any additional categoricals into this budget. In the, the, in the January 2020 Revenue Census Estimating Conference, um, this uh, information was put out. Again, this is before the COVID-19 epidemic. So the school aid fund was projected to total over 14.3 billion in fiscal year 2021. Um, and the dollar amounts are shown in the, in the pie chart below sales tax being the most um, the most amount of money that the school aid fund receives with um, $6,283,000,000 or about 45.4% total um, for the school aid fund. The next um, big largest amount that funds the school aid fund is the income tax earmark, which is about 20.5%. And the third largest funding source is the state educational tax, which is about 15.7%. You can see all these um, smaller. And again, this is all information from the January 2020 cents, uh, Revenue Census Estimating Conference. This was also a chart that they presented in January. Um, nominal school aid fund revenue had grown steadily since fiscal year 2011 and 12, but in inflation adjusted terms, however, Fiscal year 2021 revenue is estimated to be just 0.6% above the fiscal year 1999-2000 levels. So the University of Michigan um, came out with just last week um, some updates since the January um, revenue uh, estimating conference. The school aid fund revenue from Michigan's major taxes was estimated to be 
874.2 million in March of 2020, about 59.6 million below the amount established at the January 2020 um, estimating conference. Lower than projected sales tax collections in conjunction with the decline in casino revenue accounted for much of that discrepancy between the actual collections and the monthly target that was estimated in January. Year-to-date school aid fund revenue for fiscal year 1920 is 36.7 million below the census revenue projections that were done in January. Lower than expected sales tax collections are the primary reason although casino tax revenue and state educational tax collections are also below the year-to-date target estimate. This is a um, chart that shows our MIPSERS costs and when the state projects that, they, that will, um, the state will have the underfunded accrual liability paid off and that year is in 2038. The dark blue is the base funding retirement pension costs that we typically um, pay on all of our salaries. The um, lime green color is the cost offset that we actually get in our state aid um, in our state aid payment and we turn around and, and, and pay it back to the state. And also the teal is the underfunded accrual liability rate cap funding that we also get in our state aid funding and turn around and pay back to the state. We'll take a look at some of the 2021 preliminary budgets set for South Line Community Schools. The Finance Committee met on April 6, 2020 and April 13, 2020. We reviewed the 2021 preliminary budget. We discussed the potential delay in the state budget adoption um, because of the corona or the COVID-19 epidemic. We discussed possible per pupil reductions for 2021 and even possible 1920 per pupil reductions due to COVID-19 pandemic and, and the loss of the sales tax and the school aid fund. Um, it, they are talking um, at Oakland Schools business official meetings as well as we could see um, a cut in this year's um, per pupil funding as well and it will reduce our July state aid payment. Um, the finance committee suggested that we, we budget conservative, conservative and amend the fund balance policy for the 2021 school year because policy of 10%. The 2021 preliminary budget that's in your board packet, the total, the total operating revenues for South Line Community Schools is $92,103,359. Million, $103, total operating expenditures are $91 million, $131,815, the net operating income of $971,544. We do have transfers to other funds in the budget of $1,491,779, uh, bringing um, the 2021 decrease in fund balance to $520,235. Most of our revenue in the um, preliminary budget is 92% made up from, comes from the state. 3% um, of it is federal grant dollars. 4% comes from Oakland schools as flow through monies or grants we get through them. And 1% of our revenues is coming from other local um, sources. The 1920 overall per pupil, per pupil allocation for uh, this year is $8,111 with the 114 um, increase that we did build into this budget that brings the 2021 total per pupil allocation to $8,225. We did decide as a finance committee that we would um, budget for no enrollment increase. Um, hopefully this is going to offset the per pupil funding that we decided to stay with at this point because so many things are unknown. We did, we did drop the enrollment projections to a zero increase. Our 2019 fall student audited count was 8,773. So this preliminary budget is built off of a 2020 estimated fall student count of 8,773 students. When you take our estimated student count of 8,773 and our spring um, 2020 count, which was just this past February, which has been audited of 8,724 students, 
that's a weighted average count of 8,768 students to get a blended count to calculate our state aid amounts. Um, it, state aid is pay, paid off of 90% of your fall count and 10% of your spring count. Um, the total foundation revenues projected for 2021 in this budget is 72 million 116,800. Of that money, um, we we actually collect um, we uh, we levy 18 operating mills from our local tax base, and so we collect that from our local taxpayers, and that comes off of the state amount that the state owes us. So of the foundation amount of $72,162,800, is the amount of the 18 mills operating levy that we would levy from our local taxpayers, which brings the state foundation portion coming directly from the state to $62,944,733. We also do budget um, a half of percent delinquency on the, on the 18 mills that we levy from our local uh, taxpayers, and that amounts to about $50,750. So the amount of our total local taxes in this um, budget is 91,121,317. We did increase uh, the retirement sections 147, um, all categoricals of section 147 um, that come through the state of Michigan. A slight increase this year, 1920 current allocations for those retirement amounts was 7,342,966. We've estimated an increase of 17,623 in that categorical, bringing in the 2021 estimate allocations to $7,360,589. While Proposal A was never intended to fund all schools equally, the question must still be asked. Are South Lyon students worth millions of dollars less than an average district in the state? South Lyon Community Schools um, currently um, collects um, minimal base per pupil foundation from the state. Some of the local districts surrounding us, Southfield Community Schools, is base foundation is $11,331 per pupil. Based on our student count of 8,773 students, they get $28,249,060 more than South Lyon does. There's also a few other um, districts you can look at on that, on that chart. State average, for uh, per pupil foundation is $8,403, which with our student count would bring in an extra $2,561,716 more than what we do at the base minimum amount. This is a chart that shows, this is from 1819, and this, um, this information comes straight from the Michigan Bulletin 1014. Um, it is a total of 827 public school, um, which 538 of them are public school districts, 289 are charters. And this shows you where we rank on um, how, many, how much revenue we get per student. This isn't just uh, um, per pupil foundation revenue, this is all revenue collected by the district, divided by how many students we have. Um, South Line Community Schools uh, total revenue per pupil is $10,099, which puts us at 559th district in the state for bringing more revenue, revenue in per pupil. We look at our expenditures in the 2021 preliminary budget. Salaries are budgeted are 50% of the budget with benefits at 36%. Um, Purchase services are at 6%, supplies are at 5%, capital outlay is very minimal, it came in under 0%. The salaries in this 2021 preliminary budget are um, budgeted with an increase because we did increase the per pupil funding. So the contract state that 62.5% of the estimated per pupil increase um, is, is given to the SLEA um, staff members 
The increase is a 1.4% in per pupil funding, which would amount to 0.88% for um, our teachers' salary increases. MESPA's contract gives them 65% of the 1.4% per pupil increase, which would bring their in salary increases to 0.91% next year. These percent increases and in salaries are included in this 2021 preliminary budget, along with step increases, new hires, retirements, and resignations. The overall estimated increase to salaries is $1,002,571. The fringe benefit includes the impact of the PA 152, the cap increase by medical CPI of 3.3%. The differences are paid by the employees and the overall estimated increase is $982,320 for the PA 152 hard cap on um, employee benefits. Retirement also did increase uh, for 2021. Uh, I budgeted per what Office of Retirement Services suggested we budget for 2021, which is 39.9%, 91% total rate. 27.5% is our average retirement rate for all of our different plans, and 12.41% is the MIPSER stabilization rate. Overall estimated cost increase in the 2021 preliminary budget for retirement is $549,326. The um, additional costs from the 1920 amended budget to the 2020-2021. We are not projecting, we are, we did include three um, FTE teachers in this 2021 preliminary budget to increase teachers by three FTEs. We did increase, uh, or we estimated a 0% enrollment increase in targets class size for K through five classes at 25 students. Instructional versus support costs. Instruction is, if, is defined as direct classroom costs. This does not include costs such as guidance counselors, media specialists, social workers, nurses, PT, and OT. Budget adjustments have been focused on non-instructional areas and keeping the dollars in the classroom. In the 2008-09 year, 7.2 million more was spent on instructional costs versus support costs. And for this 2021 preliminary budget, the gap increases by 305% to 21.94 million more spent in instructional costs versus support costs. This is the chart over the years showing the difference between in instructional costs versus support costs, instructional costs being in the orange bars and support costs being in the blue bars. The financial forecast, um, we took all the previous budget adjustments and we've continued working with them on in forecasting them out in future years. It, it's including all the revenue and expenditure changes that we've received since April of 2020. Um, and it also includes revised state aid and enrollment projections. In April of 2019, um, the 2021 forecasted budget had an enrollment increase of 1% and a state aid increase of 1.4%, with 21-22 being a 2% increase in enrollment and a 1.4% increase in state aid. This budget revised um, this year in 2021, we're projecting a 0% enrollment um, increase and in keeping the 1.4% state aid increase in pupil funding. The 21-22, we dropped down to 1% enrollment increase and keeping the same 1.4% pupil funding increase. We also did the same for the 22-23 projected budget. This is a bar graph showing our revenues over expenditures in our general fund. You can see in these um, preliminary budgets for 2021, 21, 22, 22, and 23, they are projecting that we dip into our general fund fund balance as we will have expen expenditures over revenues. This is a bar graph showing where the fund balance lies um, with 2021, 20, 21, 22, 22, 23, actually, and 
1920 being estimates. Um, and you can see it declining after this year. This is the same chart basically, but with a percentage compared to the board policy of the um, fund balance policy for the board, um, showing that we are gonna be dipping down below the 9% that board policy we, that we are supposed to adhere to. So we will want to look at um, maybe uh, suspending that policy or amending it for next year. In the forecast, the 2021 um, operating shortfall is $520,235. It will not meet the operating, um, the board fund balance of nine or 10% plus or minus one. It would bring our fund balance down to $7,715,785. 21-22 um, the shortfall looks with those assumptions, the shortfall would be $362,014. Um, and it also, we would still not be in board policy with the fund balance policy. And in 2022-23, it shows a loss of $544,664 to the general fund fund balance, bringing the fund balance down to $6,809,106. It is important to note that um, we did keep um, FTE growth in those projected um, budgets. So there are there is room to make adjustments and correct these forecasts if things um, don't look any better. Um, for Southline Community Schools, our Teamsters contract expires um, in June of 2022. Our MESPA contract expires in June of 2023. Our um, administrator's contract expires in June of 2020. And uh, we did do a one-year extension on the teacher's contract and it will expire now in August of 2021. So what's next? We will, the finance committee will review and meet again on May 4th. Um, the state revenue consensus meeting is scheduled for May 15th. Um, the board public hearing is scheduled for May 18th. We do not have um, a state's target budget approval date or we don't, uh, the Senate and the House haven't even put out numbers yet. And I'm sure that the governor will be putting up out um, revised numbers um, as soon as she has the time. The board approval, the board will need to approve this budget either at the June 1st or the June 15th meeting. Um, and then finalized budget documents will be done in, in late June or early July. And we would amend the budget in the fall as soon as we know actual student count and per people funding amounts. And that is it. Thank you. Um, any questions or comments? Yeah, a couple comments I wanted to make um, based off our finance committee um, uh, meetings that we had. Now, it, a lot of people are usually surprised, um, uh, at least from the community, when considering our enrollment, they think we're gaining students hand over fist and that really hasn't been the case the last two years. A lot of our growth has been in the JK classrooms, the junior kindergarten, and we're not adding any this year. So that was a lot of the basis behind looking at um, zero enrollment growth and thinking not a lot of people are gonna be moving if the economy's not doing well. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, and Stacy hit it in her presentation, is the proposed salary increases for uh, staff, essentially the teachers. Now, if the actual budget comes in with less increase or no increase, um, the raises only happen based off of what the actual increase is and not what we budgeted. So, um, you know, those totals end up falling if we get less money. Um, and one of the most important points I wanted to make is Stacy had a um, slide where she was showing um, $1.5 million in transfers. And basically that's general fund money that goes into paying off uh, bus debt for um, the money we borrowed to buy, buy buses, but then also um, capital projects, meaning fixes to buildings and things that come up that we have to address. Um, out of that 1.5 million, approximately 1 million of that could be 
done under the bond program if that passes this fall, which would give us an extra million dollars from that budget to work with, which would take us from dipping a half a million dollar into our fund balance fund balance to being able to have 500,000 extra to work with for the year. So just wanted to uh, put a little bit of an exclamation point on, you know, how the bond impacts our regular budgeting. Thank you. Anyone else? Carrie, if I could. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, just a, a reminder to all of you that um, Stacy's put an awful lot of work into the budget. And it's likely to get all blown up in the course of the next two to six weeks so that we we think of budgets as drafts as we get better information out of lansing this is the first draft of probably three or four that you're going to see that will get better and better uh, from an information standpoint as we get into the into the summer um, and i actually heard language today from lansing that suggested they may wait as long as august to provide us with clear information because they just don't have the information there. So um, Stacy will be in this process of continuous improvement on the budget um, from now through the opening of next school year. So I just wanted to thank Stacy. Thank yes, thank you, Stacy, for this as well as all of the work on uh, the new bond projections as well. Thank you. Okay, any more comments on budget? Okay, uh, next is item E, legislation. Anything? I, actually, I don't have much to talk about legislation because <laughs> nothing's going on. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna take this moment to remind you all of what a great team you have in South Flying Community Schools. Um, the way people have pulled together in uh, the midst of this crisis and the leadership that Stacy, Ben and Lisa have demonstrated and making things work and operate um, as we've shifted gears from a brick and mortar face-to-face -face educational institution to a, a cloud-based learning or whatever language people are using nowadays, uh, it has been pretty remarkable. It is the most significant shift I've experienced in 44 years of public education. And, and if I had to do it, I'm grateful I'm doing it in South Line. So that's my legislative update. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> We're glad you're here as well. <laughs> Um, okay, um, item F, CETA comments, update on remote learning plan. So our continuity of instruction plan, I just wanted to touch base on a handful of points for that as well too. And it is posted to our website, if anyone would like to read it in its entirety, and it is included in the, um, in the agenda um, attachments tonight as well. So first of all, our plan has been approved by Oakland Schools. It was approved last Thursday and we pushed that out to the community as well. Um, I want to start just by saying thank you. Thank you to the hundreds, literally hundreds of people who pulled together to, to draft this plan and put it together. Um, so quickly, just the school administration, any meetings we asked them to be in, they were phenomenal about showing up for and joining us with. And, and I should point out, we did this all over what should have been spring break. Um, so definitely a big ask and staff absolutely stepped up to support that. SLEA leadership was in every single meeting with us. So that was pretty much their entire week because it was our entire week. Um, the tech liaisons from all of the buildings who represent them and support them and their technology needs have done just phenomenal work. I literally had emails right before we started this board meeting recognizing um, the, the wonderful work some of them have done in their buildings. Um, our subject area curriculum committees have done an amazing job as well too. Um, the, even the EL um, parent liaison, she was translating everything she could into Spanish for us so our, our families that aren't um, English speakers were able to understand what was going on and follow right along. And, and access all of the support and help that's been in place, whether that was um, understanding where food pickup was available or how to get technology support. Um, and, and I certainly can't leave off our, um, our wonderful technology team. Um, what they have pulled together in a very short amount of time is, is probably a miracle. They've gotten quite a few devices out and they've, they've done it just with such um, graciousness and they've been wonderful. Uh, so we've asked a ton of people in a very short amount of time um, and I want to thank as well too Barb Heininger and Kelly Ingloom and Kristen Weber, um, at the CETA administrators with me. They've, they've done incredible work. So a couple of key points I want to just share with you about the plan. Um, again, as we shared with all the community communications, our key focus here is really about maintaining those relationships with students and supporting their social and emotional needs during this time. Um, we did start our plan today and today went beautifully well um, and we keep saying with staff um, it, we are striving for progress not perfection there's going to be bumps in the road we're going to learn as we go um, but really we couldn't have asked for a better kickoff today staff did an amazing job students did an amazing job parents 
bless them for hanging in there with us. It's been a lot of change in a short amount of time. Um, beginning in May, we'll start addressing some prioritized new learning standards as well too. So giving people a couple of weeks to get comfortable with the system, ask whatever questions they need, um, get more support and getting online if they needed that. Um, staff are checking with family. They're doing a lot of outreach to families to make sure students are engaged, that they have the support that they need, that they're able to connect with one another and with their classroom teachers. Uh, we are primarily using Google Classroom. So if teachers did not already have a, a, an online platform for their classroom, they've gone with Google Classroom. Um, elementary students are in with their classroom teachers twice a week. So they have about 10 different um, lessons and activities they engage in across the week and two live meetings with their classroom teachers as well. At secondary, students have two courses, uh, two sessions of each of their courses per week, and then also opportunities to connect with, with the staff as well um, to continue those relationships they have with their classroom teachers. And depending on the age range of the student, um, junior kindergarten could be in for as little as 20 minutes. Although I have a junior kindergartner, and it certainly didn't feel that way uh, for our first day. It was a little longer than that. And it could go all the way up to, for our high school students, 210 minutes. So it, a range really dependent on their grade and their ability to attend to the work. Um, and certainly not necessarily all in one setting. So students can take breaks when they need it, come back to it. If you want to do some work over the weekends, you could. Um, I do want to point out as well too, so students who are receiving additional support, whether that's reading recovery, special education, section 504, or English language acquisition supports, they are all continuing to receive um, some of those services from our staff. And then this, this plan actually encompasses all the way from our early on programming. So the programming that happens um, with our students from our children really from birth to age three in their home, um, those services are continuing remotely all the way through our post-secondary students or so students up to age 26 as well too. So I think people oftentimes look at this and they think K through 12 and we really have this plan that's encompassing for some of our students 26 years. Um, and then some additional information to point out, we're still reaching out to families to make sure where their resource needs are met, that their social emotional needs are met, and how can we support. So we will be surveying students at the secondary level and families at the elementary level to see if there's anything else we could support them with to help make this time a positive one and keep them connected with the schools. Um, and then for our senior students, I'm sure as you have seen, um, uh, Mr. Scaling and Ms. Fisher did that survey out to students, so trying to figure out what's happening with prom and graduation. So communication should hopefully be coming on those items um, in the next few weeks, and that will be communicated out from the high school directly. All right. Anyone have any questions or comments? <laughs> Yeah, just um, one of the things that I've heard it from my daughter already, and we've heard it from some members of the community, was the decision not to provide a GPA for um, the work being done now. So could you discuss a little bit why the decision was made and how you, I guess, balanced the options of the different ways of going forward to come to the conclusion you did? So we looked really carefully at um, the fact that only six weeks of instruction incurred prior to the school shutdown. And it took our district uh, um, a while to get our online learning up and running. So some districts that have opted for other things, really the day after school shut down, they had moved their lessons online. That wasn't the case for our district. We needed time to get things in place and get things ready. So um, it's difficult to give someone a GPA grade based off of six weeks worth of instruction. Um, so if you were taking Spanish 2 right now and, and you had an A with six weeks worth of content, that's not the same thing as taking it for an entire semester and covering all of the standards and walking away with an A. Um, so we talked with other districts, we talked across the county, our principals talked with their um, athletic league group as well too to figure out what different people were doing. Responses depended a lot upon how quickly you were able to get your online and remote learning up and running and how many of your students were able to access that. Um, so for our district, districts that were in line like us typically went with um, a pass-fail. That is predominantly the most common um, response from districts across the state right now. You either have credit or you don't have credit. If you didn't have credit as of March, or for us, March 13th, um, we need to provide an opportunity for you to bring that up. Um, but allowing students to walk away with a letter grade is not a common response right now for most districts. And I will also say we've had universities share with us that even if you provide a letter grade, they may back that out as they consider it um, because it won't necessarily be comparable for other, other districts. So this semester across the board may not really count much for students, even if we have provided a GPA grade. 
Um, I had two quick comments um, related to that. Um, I also know that the Michigan Department of Education um, strongly encouraged a pass-fail grading for this semester. Um, and secondly, I know there was some concern with um, college athletes um, and NCAA did come out and state that um, pass-fail grades will not affect our college athletes moving forward. So um, those two things definitely support uh, the pass-fail grading. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I, I actually had one. Craig got to it first because that's exactly what I was going to bring up. So I guess just to kind of go into it a little deeper, there, the, the biggest complaint I hear from people about this is not with college. It's, it's those who have really worked hard to improve the GPA. They were on track to maybe hit a milestone like their academic letter or something along those lines. Is there any flexibility for so, like, so some things like math, for instance, and, and I know this because I used to teach it, you could absolutely do an accelerated math course, get through the curriculum by June 12th, even with the missed time under these circumstances. So is there at least some consideration for certain classes and students who are motivated, or does it have to be a one size fits all? In this case, as an equity issue, we did decide that it needed to be the same for all students, um, not, not a pick and choose scenario. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, I, I do want to reiterate a, a thank you to all of our staff for putting it together. And um, both of my students started today, and it, it was a, it was successful first day. So thank you. Hey, Carrie. Yes. W would you ask Chester how many Chromebooks he's given out in the last week? <laughs> Chester, are you there? How many Chromebooks have we passed out to our students in the district at this point? Let me look at what I've got here. Uh, let's see. We have handed out 366 at this time. We've got two more handout dates this week, and we ex we've had close to 700 uh, responses of uh, families that say they need a device. Wow. And how many hotspots? Uh, I think the hotspots are like 180. I think is what the number is on those. Um, not sure. Uh, that's something that we'll get from Barb Heininger. And the hotspot is in response to the fact that the families can't get internet where they're living, not even a, a reduced cost or free version of internet, correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. With the uh, form that went out, asked them if they had uh, various different s speeds or they had no internet at all. And any of them that had said that their internet was inadequate, um, they were on a list. And uh, we had one of the principals and some of her uh, assistants calling those families, letting them know what service providers were in the area uh, where they live that provided low cost or no cost uh, internet for them and ask them to um, seek that first because it would be a much faster and they'd be able to get connected a lot faster than us actually getting hotspots. Hotspots are a hot commodity uh, <laughs> right now and very hard to get. All right, well, thank you. Okay, uh, moving on to board committee reports. Um, legislative, Mr. Clark. Uh, thank you, President Hanshaw. Uh, obviously, there's been no in-person school meetings of the Legislative Committee, but I did avail myself last week of the MASB uh, Zoom call where the guest speaker was the Senate Majority Leader Shirky. Uh, he was very generous with, our, with his time. There were approximately 170 school board members from throughout the state. I recognize a handful of names, some of them even from Northern Michigan. Um, Obviously, Stacy touched on some of the financial impacts that we're going to see going forward, which is even a potential cut in our July school aid payment. He uh, said that we, as a uh, district, need to be sharpening our pencil and looking at cuts for next year because it looks bleak for the school aid, the school foundation, excuse me, the per pupil foundation level payments next year. Uh, he also said that there's a lot of talk in Lansing that there may be a push for what's called a balanced calendar, which is a code word for year-round school, given the current environment. 
There's also the potential for a pushback or late start. Uh, he said there's a good chance that we'll be beginning school with uh, face mask requirements, and they're unsure how that's going to impact uh, extracurriculars like sports and band. So there's a lot of questions of what the state is going to be pushing. There's no doubt, he said, that the legislature wants the districts to enhance their online learning as much as we can, because that may be uh, a much larger role in the future going forward. Very interesting call. He provided a lot of input, a lot of point of view of some of the discussions that are going on in Lansing. But uh, it was it was very interesting. Uh, it's going to be a rough year. That's for sure. Okay, thank you. Um, policy, we haven't met. Um, and obviously, you saw all the um, policies and regulations is what we've been talking about. Um, finance committee. Yeah, we've had two meetings. I mean, obviously, the uh, budget presentation was the, the greatest outcome of it, along with the um, the points I made during after it. Okay. Um, facilities planning. Um, basically, it was going over the bond, and the result of that is what you saw tonight in the presentation from um, Jeff and IDS. Okay. Um, curriculum and communications. We have, oh, sorry. You go ahead, Jenny. No, I was going to say we have a meeting this Thursday, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, any other? Mr. Wright, do you have any other? If not, nope. Good okay. to go. Okay. Um, for, for, uh, for my other, um, we um, need to announce that we are going to start our superintendent search back up. Um, given that we don't know what's going on with all of this virus and how long things are gonna be out. Um, we realize that we need a superintendent by July 1, since Mr. Heitch will be gone the end of June. So we will be starting that process again. Um, it will be the same type of timeline that we had before. Um, it will be mostly online, but um, if we can open it up to anything in person, we will try that, um, but we will start uh, virtually this Thursday with our um, first step, which is going through all the applicants and determining who we're going to interview. And then we will uh, begin interviews uh, the next week. So that timeline is listed um, later in this board packet, but um, just want to let everyone know that we are going to be doing that. Um, does anyone else have a comment regarding superintendent search? It was verify the time on Thursday at six o'clock, correct? The time in Thursday is six o'clock, correct? Thank you. Yes. So that will start out as an open meeting, but we will uh, discuss in closed meeting and then we will open back up to decide who we're actually interviewing. Okay. Um, reports, Southline Educational Foundation. I know they were hoping to do a grub crawl in May. Um, I haven't heard, but I would assume that's postponed. Um, but I will uh, let you know if I hear anything. Um, we're now at item 17, which is our second opportunity for public comment. Um, I do not see any additional numbers in our guest list right now, um, but I do have two additional public comments that I was asked to read. Um, the first, while well, I'm waiting for the next, for people to join, um, the first one was by Stacy Sant. And she says, the Cougarettes would definitely benefit from a new gym. The team works hard to support the school and other teams and sometimes does have reasonable space to practice, unreasonable space to practice. Please consider them when making this decision. And another comment was from Dominique Sant. Please, oh, I think that the new gym would be very beneficial to my team because there have been many instances when other teams have walked through our practice to get to the gym disrupting us and there were times that we had to practice in the hallway or end practice early due to there being no space for us to practice. I also think that it would be beneficial to the school because they could hold more events such as the Mid-American Palm Regional Competition and make money for the school. Okay, with that, are there any additional numbers joining us? None at this time. President Hanshaw, um, could I yeah, make a comment, please? Yep. Um, I, I'm, I, during the meeting this evening, I did get a text from a parent who was expressing uh, 
how diff they were having difficulty trying to find the meeting online. I'm wondering if going forward, if we should put that on the front page of our website, like maybe the day of the meeting or the day before with the links so that people don't have to go searching how to get to our meetings. Um, because it seemed like they couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't find the link evidently to get to the YouTube page. So, um, yeah, there is actually a button on the homepage, um, under quick links and it's called virtual meeting information. Um, but maybe we could, um, maybe use social media to advertise better. Uh -huh. Um, and I'm we wondering if that's why we didn't have the people get out, get into it. Like they, we thought they would. Right. We can also add a, uh, a question on the um, actual comment card where they can check off if they're planning on calling in to speak or whether or not they just want it to be read. Um, the people that um, whose comments I read, they just wrote it in their comment and they wrote, please read this. Um, but we could offer that as a specific question if people just would like me to read the comments. Um, so some additional, we definitely need to do some more advertising of how yeah. I'm concerned if we don't make it a little bit easier for the public comments, it's going to cause some pushback. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, like I said, we did practice the public comment on Friday. Um, people were able to call in. So um, we thought we had had that covered. And I do know some people did try tonight to call in um, just as a practice and they were able to get in. So, um, so yeah, we'll definitely continue to work on our public comments. <laughs> Okay, anybody, you know, nobody else has joined. So, um, all right, I guess with that, um, we don't have any correspondence. Um, item 19 is our future meeting dates. Um, we do have all of the superintendent search tentative dates listed there. Um, hopefully people will be able to um, observe those interviews and we will offer two different opportunities to comment for that. One would be a regular meeting comment. Um, but then you could also specifically comment on uh, the interviews, interviewees specifically. So uh, we definitely would like some community feedback on that. With that, I will move to board comments. Um, Ms. Hertel? Um, so much to say, so little time. I guess, you know, first and foremost, I want to um, thank the entire district for all the work that they've done over the last weeks and weeks of uncertainty um as well as um you know trying to work their way through a maze that probably doesn't have any light at the end of the tunnel um in providing food for the community and providing um, online learning for our students um I have to commend um, so many teachers just on their own um, before even the official online reaching out to um, the kids. I know that both of my kids had multiple teachers um, reaching out with Zoom meetings or Google Meets or Hangouts, and they literally just giggled and laughed and talked about stuff. There was no... Um, pressure of any kind, you know, the kids could just talk and um, work through things or just have a chance to talk with their other friends that they haven't seen because it was such an abrupt end that they didn't have a chance to say goodbye to their teachers. They didn't have a chance to say goodbye to their friends. Um, you know, so, um, you know, I commend the, the admin staff, the teachers, the support staff, everyone that's working with the food um, just, you know, the way the community, um, the school community has come together has been quite impressive. Um, and I am, um, pleased that we're going forward with the bond. And after looking at the financials, um, I think by helping to alleviate some money out of the general fund to put it into bond would be helpful over the next year. Um, and I hope that, you know, the community will support. I've heard nothing but um, positive things about the bond, um, past and present. Um, so hopefully we'll go forward with that and we'll have a successful August. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, everybody. And hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll get sprung from our houses. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Clark. 
Uh, yes, I'd like to reiterate some of the things that uh, Mrs. Hertel said. I had numerous parents uh, sending me screenshots from Facebook uh, in, in videos and things that the, the building principals and teachers had, had put out. And I think that's great. I mean, that we, we do need our students to be uh, try to get their emotional needs met as much as possible. Uh, I do hope that the community is, is positive on the bond request, though I, I'm, I'm very concerned because I think that we're asking the community to bite off a lot at this time. We'll see how it goes. Um, the, the administration and the staff have all gone uh, above and beyond. This is a very trying time. Uh, I think we need to keep in mind, too, that the parents have a lot of frustration, the fact that our online systems were not up and running sooner. Um, and I think that's something we need to really pay attention to going forward. And we're going to have to find a way to put some plans in place to educate these kids potentially in the fall you know, from a re remote environment. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kennedy. I don't have a whole lot more to add that hasn't already been said. Um, I'm proud to be at the helm with my colleagues who I'm looking at the screen with um, to navigate through this unprecedented uh, situation that we're in. Um, our principals, when found out we weren't coming back to school this year, called every one of their teachers and said, hey, do you need anything? Are you okay? What's up? Teachers then in turn called their students just to say, what's going on? How are you doing? Do you need anything? That means more to our students, our families, our teachers, our staff, our administrators, and our board members than, than doing any kind of classroom work, worrying about a grade, or worrying about completing an assignment and getting it turned in. That's what our district is. That's, that's what makes us special. And I'm glad we're moving forward and pushing to do the things that we know we need to do just to make ourselves as good as we are. That's all. Thank you. Mr. Schweigler. Thanks for making me follow Eric. <laughs> hey, I, I, I'm a softie. I've got a kid in high school who just started driver's training online <laughs> this morning. So things around here are a little, <laughs> a little bit more edgy than usual. Yeah, I, I really just want to echo everything everyone said. I know um, uh, my two children share one teacher, uh, and she's just been wonderful. And I've heard a lot of positive comments about other teachers as well. But it's 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 not as bad as one would have expected it to be. You know, it's it's and and it's a credit to everyone that's employed in the district. They've really done a great job to pivot quickly relatively quickly, you know, and try to put something forward. So, um, you know, hope, hopefully all this hard work will, will lead to a successful start of next year. And, and I expect it to be different and I expect it will be up to the task. So, so Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Dashner. Uh, I'll probably end up reiterating a lot of what's been said, but, um, Anybody that was watching tonight, I do want to thank them for their patience as we get through our first electronic board meeting. Um, a lot of us were looking away from the screen. We're not watching an old baseball game or anything. Most of us have second computers we're looking at so we can see our electronic board packets just so everyone's aware. But uh, I want to thank technology. They really helped us out getting this meeting put together and making sure that we were going to be able to pull it off and a couple hiccups, but I think it went fairly well, went really well. And I have to, you know, again, give them kudos for getting students online that don't have devices. I, I know they've been working hard at it. Um, same thing, all district employees. I've, I've been really impressed with what I've seen during all of this, just seeing a lot of the, the action on Twitter from teachers, you know, just positive message videos, all kinds of that stuff. You know, half of them I didn't know, but I'd watch them and it still brought a smile to my face. So I um, have to thank everybody from food service to janitors, everyone that's been helping. Um, especially administration too. I know they've had a lot heaped on them. Um, Stacy, I, I appreciate um, the work you put in the budget. I also like that you continue to point out what the other schools are getting in relation to us. Um, I don't think we can share that to our community enough to let them know 
you know, how much of a handicap we're dealing with when it comes to funding in relation to other schools around us. Um, and um, as always, thanks to the donors, um, thanks to the South Lion East Education Foundation for the donation towards the therapy dog and everybody that donates or participates in the fundraising for the Education Foundation. Thank you. Mr. Abate. Thank you, Ms. Tansha. Well said, everybody. Uh, I want to thank, uh, well, first of all, Dr. Height, you, you, you got a little more than you bargained for, I think, when you picked up this assignment. Uh, I want to, um, I'm sure I speak for everybody in saying we're, we're very uh, happy and fortunate uh, to have had you here uh, at a time like this and to, to have your leadership as we, um, as we navigate through uh, finding another superintendent. So thank you so much for that. Uh, the public tonight saw presentations from virtually all of our central office um, um, staff and our departments, and uh, there's just a huge amount of work that goes into uh, putting together just those few minutes of explaining what's been going on behind the scenes. So thank you to all of you. You did a wonderful job. I want to thank our IT, Mr. Cox, uh, Mr. Russell, uh, for making this run as smoothly as, as, as possible. It went really well. Um, regarding the bond, um, I, I think we would be um, wise uh, to um, to remember and take seriously the uh, the caution and the warning that that uh, Mr. Clark brought and that, and that Mr. Swegler uh, voiced. Um, th this may be a, a bit uphill with some folks, but what that means is that now uh, more than ever we have to be um, we have to be good stewards and we have to be the best cheerleader of this and and get out there and explain the merits of of what we're trying to do for for our kids. And the, really, the strength of the board is that we take. Uh, whatever vote we've had, and we carry that forward as uh, you know, as our as our um, um, as our charge, and and we'll all do that because it uh, it's necessary. Um, and then one other note uh, to um, to our teachers. Uh, I'm talking with a lot of teachers in in two different districts, uh, and everybody is working incredibly hard, but they're also wondering if you know they're doing enough, or should I do this differently, or what about this detail, or what about this piece of the plan, and so forth. You are doing enough you are doing very well. And, and to our families, um, to our parents in particular, we take what we do in the schools very seriously because we care about your kids, but we know that priorities may be very different right now for everybody. Uh, people are grieving in, in a lot of different senses for, for, for human loss, for loss of the school year, um, et cetera. People are worried about jobs, people are worried about their families. So prioritize what matters to you. Uh, you're getting a lot from your teachers and it's all good stuff. Uh, if it's all, if it's overwhelming, it, it's okay. Prioritize what matters. Take care of your families, and we're going to be here for you through the entire thing, and and we'll make it. But everyone, it's okay to give yourself a break. It's a lot, and uh, thank you uh, all, all across the board uh, to everybody for all the things that you're doing to make this successful. Have a good night. All right. Um, again, thank you to everyone. Um, I know we've talk about a number of people, but uh, the staff, the custodial, the food service, everyone has really done um, an amazing job and uh, we definitely appreciate it. I love watching um, teachers do read alouds and the little uh, video clips from different schools with the teachers saying hello. Um, it definitely shows how much this school district cares about its students and its families. So I definitely appreciate that. Um, and I know the families do as well. Um, as a parent of a senior, I know it's been a very rough end of your school year, um, but you know we are trying to make something work and we will do um, the best we can. So um, the bond is very important. Um, more than ever, this situation shows us how important our schools are and how important um, our community is. And seeing how much the community has stepped up in helping our school district. I know a number of restaurants volunteered to help with food service. Um, I know community members volunteered to help. Um, this community wants to be involved. They want to help. And um, the bond is a very important way that they can. So um, with that, um, I will um, take a motion to adjourn. So moved by Dashner. Support. Moved by Mr. Dashner, support by Ms. Ertel. Mr. Bate, please call the roll. Yes, Ms. Hanshaw. Yes. Mr. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Dashner. Yes. I vote yes. Mr. Clark. Yes. Mr. Schregler. Yes. And Mr. Tell. Yes. Seven zero. Motion passes. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Good night, all. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.